Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is supply chain risk management with my friend Barry Conlon. Guys, you need to check this podcast out. Barry Conlon is a fascinating guy, and he founded a company called Overhaul. And I love what Overhaul is doing. So those of us in logistics and supply chain, we're paid to increase compliance, to increase visibility, to give the customer more insights while simultaneously taking costs out and taking risks out. And it's tough. We don't have all the tools and technology until now. Overhaul provides the technology and expertise to achieve those goals in an increasingly difficult environment. So check it out. But before we get to the podcast, I want to tell you about my friends at Tusk Logistics. That's T-U-S-K logistics.com. If you're a small parcel shipper, you can save 40% with Tusk. And the way you can save 40% is Tusk has a great technology and they've connected a whole bunch of regional small parcel carriers. These are carriers that have been in business for a long time and they're excellent service, better than the big guys in their region. But you could never use them because they were just regional. Tusk has connected these guys into a national network. You can save 40% and have better service. And in addition, you get Tusk's technology, which is top notch. Plus you get Tusk, their customer support. Overall, you can't lose. You get better service than you're going to get from the big guys, and you get better technology than you get from the big guys, and the service, the delivery time is better than the big guys. 40% savings. Do it. TuskLogistics.com, and right at the top it says get started. Click on that button and get started and save 40%. So how's it going, Barry? Going well, Joe. Thank you for the invitation. Delighted to be here. I'm excited to have you on here. So Barry? Please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. My name is Barry Conlon. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Overhaul, supply chain risk management company. And I am in Austin, Texas, which has been home for the last 23 years. Very nice. Very nice. So I notice you have that Irish accent. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what does Overhaul do? Overhaul provides supply chain risk management services to primarily the shipper uh, industry. If you, if you can imagine a a large corporate household name that might be producing manufacturing electronics or pharmaceuticals, they tend to have very large, very complex and very multimodal uh, supply chains. Uh, they use overhaul as a means of actually providing visibility on the shipment. So you can get logistics information, which is kind of very popular these days, but it, we also provide what's unique to overhaul is an integrity service that goes alongside visibility, which allows us to actually reinforce that supply chain to guarantee that the shipment actually arrives intact and on time. The, the intact bit. What do you mean that integrity? What does that mean? Effectively means that when your, your cargo is under the, 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 the care of a third party, that they're operating to the standards of care that are typically most shippers would have a document that actually says, this is how we want it done. Our job is to make sure that compliance is actually occurring in real time. So in the event that something is not happening, that it should be, should be happening. For example, a good one is temperature. If the temperature variation is, is putting a load at risk, overhaul has the capability of detecting that early. So it's like a preventative solution to make sure that the, the corrective instructions are issued to whatever party in the supply chain is actually responsible for the actual load has hands on at that particular time. And we can address the, and non-conformance and actually make the problem go away. So it's all about avoidance. As we as we say in overhaul, the, it's the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that, that allows us to guarantee in most cases that the, the shipment will arrive to its destination intact. So are you a, a 3PL or are you a transportation? I mean, a transportation software, or I should say global. It's a, it's a technology. Yeah, it's a tech, it's a technology, but it's not, purely just SaaS technology. So it's not just, we, we will give you a dashboard that will tell you you've got a problem at two o'clock on a Sunday morning. Now we've got, we've got personnel all over the globe, logistics professionals who are there to lean in 
and to make sure that the if you know if somebody needs to be woken up to 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 address an issue or we need to go out out of network, which typically means you're you're contacting some agency like law enforcement or customs. Yeah, there's a lot of that. So you can go out of network. And I got to say this: we don't talk enough about risk. And I'm I'm an ops guy originally. I spent most of my career in automotive, in engineering, but also in manufacturing and any ops guy worth his salt talks about risk all day, every day. That's all they think about. The, 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 so if, we, if you're designing something, whether it's a system or technology or a, a component, the risk of quality problems, the risk of manufacturing failure, the risk of supply chain failure, risk, risk, risk. That's all we're... So risk of being late, risk of cost overruns, quality, Wait, there's a million risks that we worry about when we're in the ops side. So I, I feel like if you can get to a place where you're just constantly paranoid and focused on risk, that's probably a good place to be if you're a shipper. And by the way, same as if you're a transportation and logistics guy, being paranoid pays because you might think, don't be paranoid, be optimistic. No, no, it pays to be a little pessimistic and risk adverse. And by the way, before we hit record, we're talking about risk averse. When I always am looking for the cheapest truck, that's a risk. If that's if that's my mindset that I will always be using less less than providers because they're the cheapest, that's a risk. The other side is I don't want to overpay. I want to have a cost risk. So <laughs> we have lots of risks. So I like it that you guys are focused on, and by the way, I think that's your model, right? Global supply chain risk management. Yes. yes. If we were all more risk adverse going into COVID, we, some of, I have some companies, oh, we did pretty well. None of us starved to death. In fact, some of us gained the COVID-19 or 20, <laughs> but the companies that were prepared were the ones and that's most of us, we're prepared for if something goes wrong, what will we do? Yeah, and Joe, I, I cannot, just to reinforce some of the points you made there, look, the when you look at kind of load board operations, for example, like, you know, when you're you're a shipper and you want you really want to know your partners, now you're moving towards a more online model. There's a lot of digital brokers out there. Some of them are really good. They have great tools that will help with visibility. What, what we tell the shipper is, like you can save significant savings if you're moving from that dedicated fleet to a load board kind of operation. But there's a there's a huge amount of risk from from a from a you know an integrity standpoint if you do that because you don't really know who you're dealing with. But we can make that a safe bet. So you know, okay, you're going to pay for our services. That's a, an added cost. But when you when you do that kind of hedge and you look at how much you're saving by moving to this lower cost me- method. It, it, it just, it's a no brainer. You know, you can actually safely tread where you might've previously feared to go. And there's a lot of companies out there that want the, these big savings because that's a big number. Uh, if you look at the, the, the difference in, in per mile costs in doing that kind of operation. Right. And by the way, I say this all the time, coming from another industry, I spent most of my career in automotive. In automotive, I think logistics spend is 4% of revenue, 5% of revenue. I just asked my brother-in-law, he's a CFO and in automotive. And when I was working in automotive, I typically didn't, I didn't pay close attention to logistics at all. And the idea that I'd have to save money on logistics, I wouldn't look at it that way ever. Why would I? It's 4% of cost. I have 96% of my (laughs) cost is elsewhere. So the idea that people are kind of always saying, I got to save 50 bucks, I got to save 50 bucks. Mm, a late shipment, a missed shipment's probably not worth it in most cases. But I do love the idea of an, another layer of risk risk reduction. So tell me a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you started overhaul. And then why did you start overhaul? Sure. So my, my first career was military. I, 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 was, I, I still refer to it as my happy days. When I when I came out of kind of um, high school, I went straight into the military, and I was lucky enough to get selected to a tier one special operation unit pretty pretty early in my career. So the twelve years I served in the Irish Defence Forces, uh, I spent eleven of them in a tier one unit that was primarily engaged in anti terrorist activities. I, I travelled the world, going to places like 
Somalia, Lebanon, you know, places where typically it's where I first got introduced to supply chain, actually, because we were we were protecting convoys of food, trying to get the starving people in Mogadishu. And I happened to be there when that Black Hawk Down incident occurred. So a real grounding. I, I used, we, we still say today in, in, in my endeavors in supply chain today, at least no one's shooting at me because <laughs> right. they were quite frequently during my military career. But after I decided to leave after 12 years and, and, and start a business with some friends from the military. And that, that was a company called Freightwatch, which, you know, there was a lot of technology uh, manufacturers, U.S. manufacturers in, in Ireland at the time. And they were having a really significant problem with the, a lot of the terrorists that were out of business now because of the Northern Ireland peace agreement were actually turning to crime. And uh, they were losing significant amount of freight because, you know, Ireland's like a little kind of like an aircraft carrier off the coast of Europe. But you've got two bodies of water before we hit the mainland. And we, were, we, we saw a business opportunity there and kind of helping U.S. multinationals kind of manage that risk. It was more analog back then. You'd be using physical kind of means of protection, which is really expensive and was doubling the, the freight costs. So not scalable. And we, we discovered technology was a better fit. And we started to introduce IoT devices and did what we call electronic freight security, which is, you know, basically monitoring the load for. So what is IoT for people who are not, not been exposed? It typically is, is, is a sensor array, a little piece of plastic, as I call them. You know, there, there are lots of different um, but suppliers. But it stands of, for Internet of Things. And Internet of Things. A yeah. sensor that would, and sometimes we'll see it on trucks where it'll tell you that truck came into your into your yard. Exactly right. It might give you a location, a velocity, like what speed are you going at? And that's how a lot of people determine ETA. But it also has things like temperature sensing or humidity or, or one of the very important ones we use is light. So when we know somebody's opened the door and that's not the delivery location, so what's going on? So we, we, we deploy a lot of different technologies. We have about 60 IoT sensors that are pre-approved on our platform. That's wonderful. Yeah. So when I left and formed Freightwatch, I, I ended up coming over to the States because, you know, I live in Austin, Texas and have done since I arrived here. And one of our biggest customers has their headquarters here. That's that's why I arrived. So when did you move to the U.S.? In 2000. I jumped on a plane with my wife. I told her we were only gone for six months with my five-year-old son. And six months turned into uh, 23 years in citizenship along the way. So, uh, But it was, a, it was a great grounding for me because 12 years I, I grew that company and bootstrapped it. Operating off cash flow, you couldn't get a better business ed- education than that. And... You know, then a knock on the door came and a Fortune 50 walked in the door and said, we want to buy your company. We're going to make you an offer you can't refuse. That happened. I sold it to a Fortune 50 10 years ago. But I, I sold it also on the promise of that we were going to go into We were already talking about visibility back then. It was, you know, we were looking, we had operations in Brazil. We could see the Brazilian model was very much around telematics integration, you know, aggregation of data. We really liked that and, and we were evangelizing that. And but. The acquirer decided not to invest in that. And after I was signed up for three years in the military, we have a maxim which says embrace change or get used to irrelevance because there's no other choice. Somebody else will do it if you don't. So I said, look, if they're not going to do it, I'll do it. So I left and I formed Overhaul, which is, you know, a software approach rather than a hardware approach to the the problem of visibility. And um, I I, I launched that and and, uh, we're, we're, I, I just acquired that company back off the off the Fortune 50. I, I sold it to a couple of weeks ago. So, so will freight will you, will freight watch become part of Overhaul or vice versa, or are they separate companies? No, I, I I bought freight watch back. I acquired it from the Fortune 50. I sold it to ten years ago. Well, I'm saying, are, are you going to merge the two companies, Overhaul and Freight Watch? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, they, they're a very attractive acquisition to us because they really had a global footprint that I didn't have and a lot of expertise in this area and a, and a great set of customers. So their problem was they didn't have the technology I do. So we're, we're merging the two of them together and it's a, it's a, it's a kind of match made in heaven, if you ask me. So we're, we're very excited about very it. Very nice. Yeah. It's a, I'm flying to Brazil later on today to meet some of my new teammates. <laughs> so excellent. Right. Excellent. Before we hit record, we were talking about this, and this comes up every once in a while on my podcast, but I think it bears repeating. Well, first off, thank you so much for your service. I always think that people who come from the military and they they get exposed to logistics is so important because 
logistics in that space is literally life and death. If you don't deliver that food, people die. If you don't deliver those weapons, your team, your, your team potentially dies. Right. But I also think it's, it's logistics while people are shooting at you and you're delivering to people who are on the move, who are being shot at. I think the bar is so much higher. It is so much harder, but it's also, I think if you watch, we, we all watch the stuff uh, in Europe right now with the Ukraine and Russia. And what we've heard over and over and over again is Russia doesn't have good logistics. It's every other day. Yeah, they're terrible at it and always have been. It, 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 to them, it was that's always... What I, that's what I've heard. And by the way, they've always had this same thing where they put their troops almost like a human wave. It's not easy to be a soldier anywhere, but I think it's really hard to be a Russian soldier because you're going unprepared, it seems these days. Yeah, yeah. And it, when you mention things like that, it, one of the one of the main reasons that we have been successful and why integrity is so important in supply chain is that in this kind of crushed environment where we're losing some vital kind of arteries, like the Trans Siberian Railway, for example, or problems with Brexit or COVID, what COVID taught us is that when you make that shot, that origin to destination move, especially if it's in a multimodal environment. You really have to get it right the first time because replacing that today is almost impossible. And right. that that that's why you know doing it right the first time is so incredibly important. And it's one of the reasons why visibility is so appreciated in this industry today is the fact that that's what we used to call in the military a force multiplier. Right? It it but it it's it bats way above its weight. And um, you know it's such an incredibly important part of logistics today. It's kind of be situationally aware. But you got to get it right the first time. There is no redo. It's market share. You've given it away to somebody else. Yep. So you mentioned multimodal, and we'll talk about that more. So just the level set people who aren't typically doing that, what do you mean by multimodal? Well, usually if, if you look at a typical customer movement for us, there might be a CM somewhere, contract manufacturer somewhere across the globe. It could be in China. It could be in Vietnam, which is very popular right now. It's, it's almost always offshore, although some nearshoring does occur these days. But your CM is who you're asking to manufacture or provide a vital ingredient to, you know, a pharmaceutical, for example. That's going to be a road moving to a port. It's going to be a, a, a maritime. It's going to be in a box. It's going to be in that ship shipping container. Exactly right. It's going to be in a container and it's going to probably do a feeder move to a consolidating point where it goes on one of these big vessels. And that might be going to, say, the port of Rotterdam. And then it goes on a barge that goes up the Rhine. Then it gets transferred to a, a truck again. So there's like two surface movements. This is about the fifth vendor you've used and the handshakes have all, all occurred. And then it gets delivered and then the last mile, maybe somebody else, right? So you're dealing with lots of- And that of would be things. going to Europe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're, you're dealing with different kind of federal kind of requirements to, to say. So in that kind of environment where there's a lot of handshakes, every time there's a handshake and freight is at rest, it's at risk. And that might be just kind of poor handling, not even something as nefarious as theft. But they all matter because the result's the same. A damaged product means it has to be replaced. You have to keep a customer happy. And then they say it's $7 for every one you lose to replace it. So it, it's in everybody's best interest to know compliance has been maintained as it goes through these various handshakes and that the integrity of the actual shipment is maintained. In some cases, some of the federal customers we would have are more worried about stuff being put in rather than be taken out. So there's a different way of looking at that, right? So... And it's so easy to actually access the freight in this moment. You mean like drugs or contraband or even people or bombs? Or code. Code? Yeah. Think about it. If, it, if it's a federal shipment and it's a, a piece of electronics that's going into a government operation, you know, you don't want to, and maybe there's a manufacturer going on in, in a country that might have a, a great interest in actually kind of getting access to that kind of um, very, very sensitive kind of piece of equipment. So you, everybody has their reasons why integrity is important. But it's an intrinsic part of supply chain visibility in the overhaul service. You, you, you get visibility, which is great for logistics management, but you get it with this added benefit of we're going to look at your compliance. We're going to manage that vendor against that set of circumstances and report only when they're in non-compliance. And then, you know, you, you get the benefit of an ability to fix, not just report. Yep. So when we talk about that multimodal, that's that shipping box that we all see, right? Can shipping container. And to your point, it gets loaded up somewhere in Asia usually, and maybe Europe, it doesn't matter, gets loaded. 
one time. It gets put on a truck, maybe rail, goes to a port, across different handoffs, as you said, different handshakes. And then at some point, it gets opened. And hopefully, the, f- the next time it's opened is the receiver. But to your point, so along the way, somebody might have said, I want to steal from you. I want to add stuff into that. I want to... Uh, Want to do something I'm not supposed to do, and or or more. Also, if it's refrigerated, it could come out of temperature range. So there's a lot of bad things. And by the way, when we talk about those shipping containers, they can hold millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff. And here in the U.S., so much of it comes to the West Coast, although more to the East Coast now. But it could get on. A, it could go by truck, rail, and then truck again. Right and be stuck, not stuck, be also at warehouses. So there's so many opportunities. And by the way, when we talk about over the road transportation, we want visibility, we want the reduced risk on that also. But in that, it's oftentimes a shipper, a receiver, and a trucking company, maybe a broker in the middle. There's no customs, there's no uh, different time zones. You might be in the same time zone, the same language, the same country, makes things a lot easier. So anything when you say global, the risk goes way higher. The comp- need for compliance goes way higher. And, you know, the handoffs, it's probably a minimum of 10, 15 handoffs with different time zones, with different companies, different countries, <laughs> languages, cultures, everything is different. And there's, when it's that different, each time you get a lot of risk. Yeah. And one of the reasons that we're, we're successful is that we can offer that kind of global, like Mexico is a huge operation for us, for example. And like you mentioned, language complexity in Europe, 44 different languages. You know, you're you're dealing with a lot of kind of um, real challenging envir- environmental factors that you have to kind of factor into. What if you need to contact law enforcement? Well, that might be easy to do in North America, you know, through establishing connections with, you know, FBI or whatever. But when you're dealing in, in kind of Eastern Europe, like that's where it becomes really challenging. And, you know, that out of network engagement is something that we pride ourselves on because, you know, when I look at the chief risk, risk officer, the chief security officer and the, and the head of logistics, when, when they're making the decision, they, they need to know and look in the eye and know you can solve it there, not just right. in the easy location. <laughs> you have to be able to do that because that's typically where things go wrong. Right. And you have to be able to kind of. Fix it. Right. And by the way, we all know we can call law enforcement. But like right now, if I was to hang up from you and decide I'm going to call the FBI and report something, I don't have a sense that that's going to be an easy phone call to make. It's going to sound like I'm a a crazy person. And then also, depending on what the product is, people are a little reluctant because they're like, hey, am I going to get myself in trouble here? Am I going to gain the scrutiny of law enforcement? You mentioned Brazil or my sister lived in Brazil. And she said, when you're in Brazil, and you have OnStar for your General Motors product. She says it doesn't call the Brazilian police. It calls a private security. And she said that's the case in many places. And and I think that's either because of some sort of communication lag or General Motors said, hey, this is easier for us, or maybe we don't all trust our local law enforcement. Well, that like I would be one of the companies you're, you're contacting in Brazil. Um, the, unfortunately, I have to say this, and I, I have deep respect for all law enforcement around the globe, but in some locations, there may be involvement, collusion. Well, you, you, have, the, you have incentives in many places in, in uh, the world and where you say, God, this is the only way I'm going to get ahead, or uh, you're compromised. I do know this. We've, we've all heard the horror stories of people driving Mexican truck drivers driving over the U.S. border with contraband, whatever it might be, drugs, people, whatever, only to find out that they have family held at gunpoint somewhere in Mexico. And so the guy said, I, what was I going to do? So we, so there's lots of reasons why it's not just uh, one country is horribly corrupt and another's not. I think we all have our fair share. <laughs> yeah, we're making determinations on a daily basis about which law enforcement agency within the country we're going to contact because based on a technique or location or just current situation, we, we, we would suspect involvement from another agency that might be. And so you, you have to play one against the other. And that that's kind of what we're really good at is, is making these determinations about who, who should we be escalating to? Because we do need law enforcement involvement. You know, oh, you know yeah. that's a requirement. 
our insurance customers are, you know, very interested in that because, you know, you have to follow the process of the law if there's a claim is filed and that kind of thing. So positive engagement in law enforcement is a critical out of network capability because we're doing that with technology. So I, when we have a stolen load, like you're saying, you, you pick up that phone, you call a guy, is that going to be a difficult call? With us, it's a, it's a technology interchange with that law enforcement agency. We're dropping a package onto the cop who's 10, yard, 10 miles in front of the stolen load in that direction of travel. Hallelujah. So he, yeah, so he can, he can intercept it. And doing that in North America, where it's already gone from one state to another, is don't call the local, lo- local guy. He can't do anything. It's now a, a federal crime. And that's where you're contacting the right agency to interdict. So all of that kind of nuance and kind of complexity we take care of, and it's just automatic on the platform. Yep. So we, we, we already started switching into talking about problems, which is good. So the first problem is we do have theft. We talked a little bit about that. So what's another problem that you, and I think before we hit record, you were telling me this whole idea of avoidance. So talk, what do you mean by avoidance when it comes to a problem like this? Well, Theft, believe it or not, is not the biggest problem out there. Damage, like shock, freezes, you know, to sensitive or perishable, maybe FDA monitored or FDA controlled shipments, such as food and and pharmaceuticals, for example. So I'll give you a good example around shock. So a CM is manufacturing, a contract manufacturer is manufacturing some, let's just call them game consoles that are very popular right now. And we three hours into a five hour journey to the port. So it can be put the, the box, the container can be put on the ship to start that kind of multimodal journey. We notice there's a, a significant shock event, you know, that registers way above the drop test. Let's put it that way. Right. So we're immediately contacting, not telling the shipper because the shipper is just going to say, well, what do you want me to do with this? So, so we're immediately contacting the CM to say, Hey, the freight forwarder, the CM, you need to, realize that there's just been an event and that is non-compliant that has to now go back to, to be inspected right so it would turn around three hours journey back they took it off and more than half the load was destroyed right through that shock event what, what actually happened was as it happens a lot without telling anybody in the supply chain the, the transportation provider decided to, to change vehicles for whatever reason and when they were transferring that container it dropped right it wasn't done professionally but in, in a previous existence, what would have happened to that, um, Joe, it would have gone to that kind of supply chain I described on the way to Amsterdam, to Rotterdam. It would have gone up the Rhine. It would have been then been sent to a distribution warehouse and they would have inspected it there five weeks later. And they would have realized that more than half the load was damaged and nobody knows how or why. Or who's responsible. Exactly. <laughs> but what, what happened here is that the replacement was easily kind of, they, they took away what was damaged or could be repaired and they put on new. It actually made the sailing because you, you, you normally have a bit of wiggle room there. There's going to be a couple of days either way when you, when you send it to the port. And you just had a happy customer in the end of the, at the end of this kind of multimodal environment. That, that happens, I'd say, on a day-to-day basis around temperature variation, which is the biggest fluctuation you see, where... Believe it or not, freezing is the biggest problem uh, where product is actually put into an environment where if it stays this amount of time at this temperature that's not compliant, it is destroyed. And that could, it may as well have been a theft because you're, you're, you have to trash the whole load and replace it. So that kind of uh, integrity through the chain of custody. And, and so our, our platform would know that product has this amount of time. We call it temp time tracking. So you're actually able to kind of marshal and mobilize. So if it needs to get into a cold storage because it's it's getting a heating event, we're in a position to direct the driver to give him, like literally go left instead of right. You need to make it to this uh, control storage. It's all about avoiding that claim. And we, we, we've got currently speaking about a trillion dollars in cargo value that flows through our platform in an annual basis. Our loss ratio, which is a key statistic that the insurance industry measures your your premium on basically what are we going to charge you for insurance is performing at least two three hundred percent better than the the best in industry in the insurance wow. today yeah it's because we're literally why we're successful is we're doing we're fixing we're not just reporting and that means there's no claim even when previously it would definitely have gone to a claim there was no other way of avoiding it because you just don't know so our visibility is not really the service it's the tool we wield 
to allow us to actually make corrective action and get everything. It's like, I call it like herding a cat because we all know logistics is, can be a challenging environment. Joe, you know that better than anybody. It's a, it is herding cats, right? And we're, our job is, is digitally to be poking the cat onto the line to get them straight and narrow uh, on a day-to-day basis. And, and thousands of times a day, we're doing a little poke here to make sure people are, are, are going back in line. Right. And previous guests talked about servers. You make it get built by a server that might be in China or Malaysia, somewhere over there. And as it's coming to the US, it gets to your point dropped. At some point, we're going to talk about a claim because that's a million dollar piece of equipment. Right. It's a lot easier to say, well, we've got, we caught it while it was still in Malaysia and now we're going to get a replacement. We're going to inspect it. Then to let it ship 30 days on the ocean and then be sitting in storage. And then you find out it's broken only after you start to move it. And it reminds me years ago when I was still doing logistics, we had one of our customers, we had an LTL shipment where the truck rolled over. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but um, we notified our customer and said, Hey, this, this happened, but your stuff's going to get there, but we need to inspect this. So they, they inspected it. They said it all. Well, First off, the trucking company inspected it said hardly any of the boxes are even damaged. But these were instrument panels for cars. And our customer said, it's all gone. We're not using any of it. And when, they, when I said, I called, <laughs> I said, hey, can we, um, can you test these? I mean, can we test them in the factory? They go, uh, no, we can't. We do, we do have a tester, but it's on the regular assembly line. And here's the thing. We're selling it to one of the OEMs, one of the large original equipment. And if we tell them that a batch of instrument panels tipped over and flipped over, they would say non-compliant. So it was interesting. We could have not said anything. The trucking company could not, could have just said, no, no damage. Because you couldn't tell by looking at the parts. But as it worked out, we scrapped all of it. And... You could say that's a big waste, but if you're in that car that you just bought a brand new brand new car, you don't want to find out your instrument panel's broken. Or, and again, it, when you say broken, it could be a chip in the back. So you go, it looks beautiful, it just doesn't run. <laughs> right. One of the interesting aspects of you know keeping everybody honest aspect of, of of the platform is, you know, we're sharing this information. It's a two way street. Like we're giving the freight forwarder, the carrier, the broker what he needs to be successful. If there's something wrong, we're going to them. We're sharing that. And it's, it's very open. It's very transparent. But also, as time goes on, people are aware you're, you're, you're doing that. So, you know, I call it like the cop with the speed gun. You know, if you know big, he's around big the corner. Brother. Big brother's there. <laughs> yeah, you can look at it that way. But it, it actually, from the shipper standpoint, is they're saying, look, I just want to ensure you're living up to the contract we've, we've signed you up to. And... We, we, this is how you should be doing it. But now we've actually got data to show us how well you're operating. So a lot, a lot of the freight forwarders and, and carriers that are on the platform get a real benefit out of that because, you know, they're getting more business because they're, 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 they're showing that they're, they're, they're one of the better uh, engaged, successful kind of partners. And that's, that's a good thing. By the way, I've, I've said many times, and I still say it, if I'm working with you, Barry, and I owe you a certain service, and let's just say it's logistic services, and it's happening hundreds of times per week, like truckloads or shipments from overseas. I'm going to tell you every time we screw up, my company screws up. I'm going to tell you, I say, Barry, this week, 99% of the shipments arrived on time, four didn't. And here's the four that did not. And here's the reason. And here's what we're doing to prevent that. That's, and by the way, you as a good um, customer will say, Joe, I appreciate you being completely open and honest and being proactive to solve these problems. Now, if you yell at me and say, I can't believe 1% didn't deliver on time, I'm going to start to lie to you. So so I always say, if you, sh- if you shoot the messenger, he won't bring you any more bad news. <laughs> it's, so, it's so true, though. And like the fact that the shippers now trust us to kind of communicate this kind of nonconformance. But I think the good logistics companies will say, I appreciate getting feedback even if it's not positive oh, so we can it. address it yes i love it because the, you're 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 actually helping them do a better job and we we call it the network effect that we have a lot of freight forwarders that were literally dragged kicking and screaming into the first meeting when a shipper said hey i want to use overhaul right and now now they're actually talking about us to 
other shippers who who could benefit from this because they it is that kind of transparent environment you you, you win when you give bad news first you're, you're you own it and and you want to fix it but to fix a problem you have to notice a problem right and that's that's really where where overhaul excels is kind of surfacing only what's relevant and sharing only what's important to actually correct and it, it works for everybody in the, in the chain now, i'm just now that you mentioned overhaul it just hit me this is almost like Overwatch, like a military term. Was that the original name? <laughs> it, it, it was. Like our first name was Freight Watch. And I suppose uh, if it does what it says in the label, you know, it's. A, it's is a it good... Overwatch like the sniper or the uh, team watching above the, the, yeah. the uh, satellite? That's right. Yeah. Keeping everybody safe. So, so before we hit record, you mentioned something about insurance. How what, how do you guys interact with insurance? Yeah, so we we've got a lot of really strong relationships in the insurance industry. You, you can imagine, like if you're an insurance company or if you're an insurance broker or if you're you know a, a retail outlet selling shippers' interest insurance primarily, which is cargo policies, and there's they're required by law, as you know, there's a certain level that you have to actually have. So it's a pretty big, important kind of area of most supply chain professionals PL, like they they have to manage this piece so you know we we've radically changed in a positive way what premium can be paid for that policy but by the fact that we're, we're producing such strong numbers so if, you, if overhauls on the inside your likelihood of not having a claim is significantly better and that that will drive a much more uh, uh, it will save you significant significant coin uh, when you're actually covering your insurance policy whether you're the shipper the carrier, a 3PL. And that's that's really where I think the 3PLs are really engaging with us is the fact that they, because in, in many cases, a shipper will ask the 3PL or the 4PL to kind of include the insurance as part of the, the transaction. And, but it's it's all, it's a very big number when you, when you kind of look at the breakdowns and how they work. So bringing some real kind of cost reduction to that kind of line item is significant. But again, it, to me, it's kind of in the world where, People are still trying to figure out what visibility really means for the supply chain. We're, we're targeting direct ROI on that right now by saying, well, what it really means is reduce insurance rates. That's one benefit you get from visibility, and we can actually me- measure that. And um, we, we don't produce the paper. We partner with long-established companies. Are, you know, we've got several insurance companies that are, are good partners, and also brokers, insurance brokers who typically represent the shipper in this engagement are also kind of recommending uh, the impact that we can have here. So it, it's, it's uh, I think we're the only one out there right now using visibility and real-time information to actually change how insurance is actually, de- uh, our, our, uh, the transaction is actually uh, uh, encountered in, in, in the space. So that is real transformative change we're bringing uh, to that space. Yeah, it, it reminds me, um, I forgot which one of the insurance companies lets you put the monitor. Maybe it's what it or flow does, progressive. We can take that. And I can put that I can put that tracker in my car, and potentially I save money because they see that I never go over the speed limit, and I don't have a whole bunch of spike stops where I slammed on the brakes. And maybe they also say, you know what, Joe lives in a safe area, and he drives his car and parks his car in only safe areas. Well, they all might also find out, hey, that Joe works from home, and uh, his car doesn't move some days. We like that. We like the cars that stay in garages and safe areas, right? So they have more and more data on me that makes them it's easier and easier. So I think we're going to start seeing insurance products that become much more individualized, almost to the point of no, but no two people have the same insurance because your profile is that different. Yeah, and Joe, the, the, per mile base is the holy grail, right, for insurance engagement. And that's where that's where we're moving rapidly. By the way, so you can imagine just some of the other data sets you can you can bring in and kind of fold into this kind of. We always say there's two different data points that we monitor. One is the actual, if it's a sensor, it's the the, the buyer of of the service. So we're we're tracking that movement of cargo, and we then we look at contextual information around that. So can you imagine a database that tells you down to a street corner level, zip code level, what the likelihood based on that jurisdiction for if you get it, if that truck gets into a problem here, how likely is it to be a kind of a, a nuclear verdict, for example? That's a, another data set. You can look at the fact that a lot of issues occur in work zone areas and you can track them because they, 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 they tend to move, as we all know. Might be slow, but they move. So can you track like what speed is he doing through the work zone versus 
Montana where there's a big white highway and nobody's really that concerned. So when you start adding these data layers in on top of all that, now you have something that's really intelligent and is actually driving behavioral changes that's good for your bottom line. And that's that's what we do. So can you also give me, so let's just say I'm a shipper and I'm moving freight from the middle of China through, through the port to a port in New York, and then it comes out somewhere in Virginia. Can you tell me how many days it takes and where where my stuff stayed where my stuff stayed the entire time? You have to be able to have that kind of situational awareness. Like every day would be waking a, a customer up, a shipper up to say, "Hey, you know, this box has sat in the port for twenty days. You know, it should have only sat there for you know nineteen. And it's it's we we know the door's been open, so the customer inspection has occurred. So it, it should be why isn't it moving? Because we're we're trying to get when freight's at rest, it's at risk as far as we're concerned. Keeping it moving. I've just talked to uh, Sean Barden over at Quale. He talks about they track those boxes for the, some of the big uh, the shipping containers for some of the big steamship lines. And if I bought one of those boxes if Maersk does or one of these other large companies, I want that box to be doing its job all day, every day. That's an investment. I want it working. So anytime my box is sitting for more than I think it should, it's not working. And 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 you think about what we want. I get like that box came ashore. I want it to, so let's just say it came from China. It came ashore two weeks ago. I want it empty and shipped back to China. So it can be filled again. That's my. That's the, the job of my box is to return money to my pockets. Same with trucks. We want our trucks moving as much as they possibly can. We want our warehouses uh, working as much as we possibly can. It's just the nature of investment. So I love love what you're doing. So and uh, let me ask you one thing. This is getting a little off, off a tangent, but are you guys able to kind of start predicting the future using AI with and like doing that? On digital twin stuff with your software? Yeah, what, what's the data telling us? The the the, the digital journey. Yes, it's, it's it's very important to the customer. Like like we're able to do that now. For example, with six years of data on loss ratio. You know, when we first started off, we we, we kind of figured our mouse trap was better, but unless you can show an actuary the data, <laughs> and that data better be like at least precise. Five, yeah, they're not going to believe you. Like it's a it's still a punt. But that's where the data is really starting to show, like, 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 what is the data telling us? How can we share that with our customer? How can we help make their operations more efficient? Well, you were talking about asset utilization. Statistics are hugely important to make sure that you're getting the most out of your your equipment. I'm, those those are all investments that have to be working for me. Yeah, and like we're in a unique position because we don't own hardware that we can get other hardware owners like a box owner, like a container owner or a telematics system that's installed in somebody's rig or, you know, a trailer tracking system that's uh, there for us. We can, we're not competing with any of those uh, technology providers. It's one of the reasons why we don't own any hardware. And we, we like, I've got 60 different IoT sensor providers that are certified to be on my platform because I, I know their capabilities and I, I help the customer understand what's the best fit, what's fit for purpose, if they're going to be using IoT devices. And then, you know, there's already a, a connected technology out there. So we just connected that through integration. Right. So, let's so not- what would be some of those uh, IoT companies you work with? Name a few just so people have a sense for it. We use a lot of Calamp, some Tive. We would use other vendors like Sysvoco, some of the more cutting edge technology providers. But I can tell you that there's, there's three of my shippers who have built their own technology. Now, think about that for a second. Like shippers, like I'm talking about household named electronic manufacturers that have their own IoT tracking device. Because for whatever reason they want to build their own, I, I don't care. I, I will test it. I will make sure that it, 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 it in a side-by-side test with what we know is working really well, how is it performing? And I'll help that manufacturer, that device, make it better. We use tra- specific Devices like maybe an RVM device that tells us when a door is open on a container. So the reason why we don't own any of this hardware, Joe, is that, it, look, Moore's Law tells me that every 18 months, that hardware will turn over at least once. Right. And it'll be smaller. It'll be faster. It'll be more capable. It'll be cheaper. 
And I want to bring these benefits to the shipper, to the freight forwarder. So don't worry about what hardware is being used. And that's my job to make sure you get the right, you know, set. It might be two different devices doing totally different things. Or I can say you don't need a device because we have an integration with that technology already. And it's already installed like an ELD, for example. So let's just use what's already there. Let's not have any more complexity. Let's keep the device. I love it. Yeah. So it's, 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 I can, I can be that Switzerland of data. I, I really, I don't have any natural predators out there because I'm not competing with. Them. Right. You know what I love about this is I'm, I, I did when I was still working in automotive, I did value stream mapping or lean, right? And we were doing it for the supply chain. And so we would work with all the big companies like the Magnus, the TRWs, whatnot. And they have worldwide supply chains. And what we would try and map it, but we did it manually, which was better than nothing, but it's not great. What I love about what you're doing is you can take me from order, from the time there's an order, to the time I got cash, order to cash. And let's just say it's 18 weeks. I can sit down with my team as a, the shipper location, the manufacturer. I can bring in some of my logistics guys and say, we're going to walk this. And, and you can start to say, why is this sitting for four days uh, on average in this location? What's going wrong? Why, why can't we get, can we notify them sooner so we can leave? So when it gets there, it gets processed and moved faster. Oh, also, I want to talk about over here. This is where most of our damage is happening. Why is it happening? Well, it's things are falling off the shelf or whatever it is. Can we figure out what's going wrong? And, and, that stuff we've done it in the past, but it was it took like you had to be an investigator, yeah, and it was anecdotal and it was not based on stats. It was based on well, last time it fell off a shelf, that was the shock. This this starts to pull together a picture that is complete, that is actionable. That I can say when I meet with my suppliers and my team. And say, let's figure out how to go from 80 days to 60 days. I can do it looking at actual data. And when I say I want to go from 1% damage to 0.1% damage, what do I need to do? Yeah. And we call it the single source of truth, Joe. That's that's basically what it is. Like it, we brought our data together. It's- do you use that at home? You talk to the wife, say, look, I'm the single source of truth. I bring it right at home from work. <laughs> Transparency. Yeah. yeah, I do a lot. No, but it's actually, it's a great point because it is all about optimizing performances and you know process improvements. And when you have that data set, you can rely on. Because one of the things, it, this is very important, Joe, because it's, there's a lot of, let's just say there's a lot of chatter out there around visibility. And there's also a lot of disappointment that it's not living up to the billing. You, you probably have heard some of this, but for us, we cannot rely purely on the integration model, which is what our competitors do, right? Because there's always gaps. If you talk about that end-to-end multimodal, you cannot have a gap. There can't be a two-day, three-day black hole where you don't know what's happening because you don't have the integration. And that's why we, we depend on IoT a lot. And our customers become obsessed with this data because they can rely on it. It's real. Well, it's the data that's end to end. That's why I would want to look at it. And it, and I can also, again, when we talk about digital twin, at some point we're all going to have supply chains from order to cash that is what's happening in the physical world is precisely uh, captured in the digital world. And the great thing about that is at some point we can start doing a lot of scenario planning, maybe get AI and machine learning. And at some point it's going to start telling us where the risks are. And it might start saying something like, hey, that region of China is becoming a problem. We've had more and more. Uh, and this, is, this might be outside data that you're bringing in, but it's going to allow us to make these supply chains much, much better, uh, faster, better, cheaper. So let's switch gears. You said th- this is primarily shippers who are buying it, but even when the shippers buy it, you said a lot of 3PLs like the whole idea of it because it's useful to them too. How long is the implementation of something like this? Is this like when I call you from, is it a month? Is it a week? Oh, it, from from the time where we sign a contract with a customer and roll out a global program, you're, you're, you're talking about no more than say maybe a week, possibly two, depending on the complexity and the locations we're going into. But to set up the program, quickly is like it's a now, is that assuming like let's just say they don't have one of the sensors that they need now that that would be a bottleneck they would have to get that sensor or would you would you recommend it and get it for them 
Yeah, yeah, we it's seamless. So it's a real turnkey kind of uh, opportunity for customers, and, and especially when you're dealing with third parties like a contract manufacturer. So w- what would take the week would be sending people in to train them. Like we'd we'd hand over a tablet that allows them to do two quick barcode scans and you know click on the origin destination drop down menu, that kind of stuff. So there's no human thought process required. Follow the steps; they're simple, and you know you you, you might be adding a sensor or capturing an image of what's the reference number of that seal what's the reference number of the container all of that kind of vital information that you would need to package but we make that easy by giving them a tool like a tablet to to kind of just follow the instructions you don't have to do anything except in the, in your own natural language which we would give them on the tablet just follow one two three done so you, I'm assuming you have some people who can do that implementation, obviously, of salespeople. Now, you mentioned support. Do you have people who speak every language uh, necessary to make this happen? <laughs> yes, or where our customers have operations, yes. In our in our fusion towers, we've got one in Prague. We've got one in Brazil, in, in Sao Paulo, and Mexico City, and Austin, Texas, uh, is where we have this capability. And because yeah, remember, you might have to talk to local law enforcement officer for for recovery purposes now that's again is a digital transaction but it has to be in his native language right so you you do need that kind of language expertise globally um that's that's look one of the reasons why our big shippers it's good to have a european involved because you're used to all of those different languages (laughs) yeah yeah europe has got a lot of languages i think it's like 44 or something like that uh i i only tell this joke about every three weeks but i'll say it again if you speak Two languages, you're bilingual. If you speak three languages, you're trilingual. If you speak one language, you're an American. <laughs> <laughs> it's changing. It might be Irish as well. Let me just say. <laughs> well, it's funny. When I went to school, they taught us French. And I was like, why are we learning French? Uh, you never know. We might be doing business in France or e- Africa. We didn't learn Spanish because we didn't even do business with Mexico very much at that time. It tells you how old I am. Anyway. So let's wrap this bad boy up. Mostly shippers working with you, and it's real easy to set up. Is is this a huge investment for these guys, or is this a monthly investment? How do they? What? How, how does that work? Multi year engagements. So you know, it's it's a transactional pricing based on volume. Obviously, uh, you know, price per shipment kind of thing. You're at a hundred thousand shipments globally. If you move into the hundred and fifty, you go into a different pricing right. tier. And and we we would sign up. Uh, Typically, it's a two to three year engagement with a shipper. Yep, and and they're saving that money in hassle. It sounds like, but also just in invisibility of where the problems are at, and then it, how do I solve those problems? And and this is the weird thing about avoidance is when you avoid problems, you sometimes don't get full credit for it, and you have to kind of be able to say, "Remember before I got here, all those problems you had." They go, uh, "No, that guy left. I don't." I've, I all I know is this. <laughs> That's why the insurance com- in- engagement is so critical, Joe, because the loss ratio is the key metric, right? That loss ratio covers theft, delay, damage, spoilage, everything. And, when I was and- in automotive, we did track cost avoidance, meaning things that we caught that, that didn't happen. And, you know, because you want to be able to kind of put an ROI on your efforts. Everybody wants to, you know, if I'm paying for something, I want to be able to say this, this helped me see around a few corners that I wouldn't have seen around otherwise. Right. That's very true. And the, the insurance company is always going to be there and they have long memories. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and good data. So let's wrap this bad boy up. So, What's next for you? What's next for overhaul? And then what's next for this industry? And what I mean by that is this is the stuff we've talked about today. A- any order you want. <laughs> there's a bit of a shakeup coming, Joe, uh, if I look on my crystal ball, because there's what's next for me is we're probably going to do another maybe two acquisitions. We're, we're, we're in an enviable, position, an enviable position right now is that you know, the market has shifted dramatically in the last six months, right? What used to be like frothy, huge money valuations, people were growing. Any growth will do. It's all about growth. We we know how to run a business and we've always had our eye on profitability and sustainability. And when you look at the amount of funds we've raised in overhaul to get to similar revenues that some of our nearest, closest competitors, we've raised a fraction of the the, the growth equity they have done. And I, I think there's going to be several companies that are going to be in real trouble because that kind of find the next 
round is not going to be available in this environment. And that to me means there's going to be a bit, we're already seeing it actually. There's a lot of companies out there who raise significant amounts of money to, to, to build to their P&L to, you know, five to 10 million in A or R. Like if you're, if you're in that position, getting another round of funding is going to be extremely difficult. So I think there's going to be a lot of companies in trouble and scrambling because the, the market has shifted. And if you, if you're burn uh, and your, your, your runway, uh, how much cash you've left to sustain that burn is not controllable and you're not moving into a profitable space, you're in real trouble. And um, I think we're going to see a lot of that in the next six months. So that's, that's the industry. That's the industry. So you think the industry's, and I, you're not the first one to say that on my podcast, that there might be a bumpy road ahead for some of our business. And so for overhaul, you think you guys will continue to grow and maybe even uh, make some acquisitions. Yeah. I'm planning two more this year. Wonderful. Two more acquisitions. Wonderful. Uh, and they're going to be, they're, they're going to be bolt-ons to, you know, add strategic value to the engagements I already have with these shippers, these brands. Like, you know, I always say with customers, you know, you've got two ears and one mouth, right? So listen to your customer and they'll tell you what they, they like and what they need. Your your job is to give it to them and um, you'll have a happy customer if you, if you continue to do that. And that's that's what we do. We have great engagements with our customers and, and we tr- they trust us and, and we, we, we over-service where we can. And um, that's my future is to kind of add on additional capability uh, to this existing set and then new customers as we, as we bring them in. That's excellent. That's excellent. So as I told you before we hit record, I like to interview smart, interesting people like you. Who else should I interview? Well, we've got, there's, there's great people, as, as you, you know, people that I respect and most people I respect are my competitors. So, you know, in, in four kites, um, they're good competitors. They, they keep us, they keep us honest and they keep us active. And uh, Matt from what's his last name? Oh, uh, I always, I always pronounce his name wrong. Eccles, or I'm not, I'm going to butcher it. I'm, I'll, I'll offend him. I already offended him. <laughs> well, I can find Matt with the hard to it pronounced last name with an E. <laughs> yeah, they're also, I think you, for the industry and where it's going, Joe, I, I, Turn your turn your attention also to the private equity world. Oh yeah, that, they're on my podcast a lot. Them and the VCs. <laughs> yeah, there's some of them out there that I, I say really do know this industry, and I've made some interesting investments in it. And, and if anything, their appetite is, has not diminished; it's growing. So again, I'd say a lot of the the big kind of tier one. Give me a name. Growth equity, private equities, um, like the, the KKRs. You know the the Warburg Pincuses of the world and and uh, Summit Partners. They're they're also great visionaries on where they see the industry going and what's working and what's not. Yeah, and I should mention, guys, if you when I always say I I, I always assume people don't uh, you know follow venture capital or private equity, but I I will say this: it's you know there's all sorts of VCs and there's all sorts of private equity, but generally speaking, you see private equity is usually more interested in those acquisitions that, um, you know, where they say we're going to start making money here. VCs are the ones who are saying we're most interested in growth and we're going to build a business. And it, I, I'm assuming there's lots of companies that do a little of both, but uh, generally speaking, the VCs are the ones saying, yeah, I love this rocket ship. Let's, let's figure it out. And the private equity is saying, well, this is an established business. Let's buy another one and tuck it in into the. Yeah. They're, they're, they're interested in the EBITDA more, more than your, your, your revenue, which is very true, but they're all thinking the same now. That's, that's what really is money, money, money. Market. <laughs> they, want to, they want to see you've got a path to profit, but you're, or you're already there. And you know, that's, that's the key. If, if you don't have a plan for that, you're in trouble. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. What conferences will we see you at? This in my, in my immediate future, I suppose the Gartner conference, uh, I, that's a, an important one for the industry. There's a, it's always, where is that one at? Well, I, I don't know this time where they were in Orlando the last time. I, I'm not sure. They may be going back there again. So you'll be at the Gartner. Where else are you guys going to be at? Yeah, Gartner is one for me. And mo- most of the conferences that I attend these days are are, are more internal ones with, with, with our global team. I, I've got a, you know, my, my CRO 
is the guy who attends most of the shows. I, I don't have to do as much traveling as I used to do because, you know, now I have the team to kind of support me. But the one, the ones I, I really show up to are, are the key ones, like uh, Manifest. You mentioned Manifest. It's, I was at Manifest. Really, really I remember. loved it there. They're, they already announced next year. So, yeah, it's a good show. It's you're one of the 2,900 people I did not see there. <laughs> I think there's 3,100 yeah. people, and I probably talked to 200 and uh, loved yeah. it. There, there's also specific ones like uh, cold chain conferences that we we attend, like uh, Laji Pharma is a, is a big one in our world as well. So, yeah, there's a few of them out there. But as I said, I, I've got a team to support me now. So if it's a big conference, we will see overhaul there. Yes, you will. Excellent. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. Have a nice, safe trip to Brazil. And um, congrats on your success. Thanks, Joe. It was a pleasure talking to you, sir. Yep. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.